and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. Today's guest in episode 22 is Bernard Zool. He was visiting Brisbane in early April as a guest speaker at the inaugural Rock and Roll Writers Festival. So after a day of inspiring and enlightening discussions about all things music writing, we went back to his hotel room in Fortitude Valley to talk more about that very topic. I've been reading his album reviews and features in the Sydney Morning Herald for years, so it was a treat to pick the brains of one of Australia's most prolific and enduring writers in this field. In 2016, Bernard is actually one of very few journalists in the country to be employed as a full-time music writer for a newspaper. We talk about this very fact and the shrinking nature of such jobs, as well as how he chooses which artists to write about how he manages to juggle writing up to six album reviews per week, how he prefers to take notes in dark rooms when attending concerts, why he hates the five-star ranking system, the value he sees in writing negative music criticism, and why he now uses voice recognition software rather than typing. Introducing Bernard Zuhl, senior music writer at the Sydney Morning Herald. Thanks for having me. We're here in Brisbane in, in your hotel room. Tell me, what are you doing here in Brisbane? I'm here for the Rock and Roll Writers Festival. Uh, music and writing seems a perfect, perfect excuse to come to Brisbane. You're, uh, you're quite adept in this field, so I'm not surprised that they tapped you to come up from Sydney to, to talk about this very topic. Well, I've hung around long enough, and you know, there's, just, there's not many of us left who... Uh, so, certainly not many of us left who do it virtually full time and getting paid for it right which we'll, we'll come to but um so you moderated a panel today and you're a, a speaker on a panel tomorrow yes uh, um tell me tell us about the panel today just to start with oh well the panel today was quite interesting just on on um language uh, australian language in in comedy and, and music and whether there's uh, a, a place for it and a, and a good reason for it um, and I quite like the idea of, of Australian language in in our writing uh, I try to use it as much as possible in my writing because I, th- I think it it's how we think and how we talk and and keeping keeping it alive is a u- really useful thing culturally anyway but also as a way of reminding people that uh, what we're doing both in terms of people writing about music and those who are making music has an existence separate from the dominant forces of uh, the US and, and the UK. Mm. Um, I don't have a, a particular uh, bent for Australian music per se. I don't think that we make better music than anywhere else and, uh, and more often than not actually we make music that's second rank because we're a little behind in a lot of areas but um, in just as many areas we are as good as anywhere else and I don't make a, a differentiation just as I don't make a differentiation between um, regional music you know, uh, I'm from Sydney but I don't seek out Sydney bands as a preference to Brisbane or Melbourne bands you don't see it as your role to uh, champion Sydney bands over anyone else in particular no I don't and uh, that's partly personal but also partly I think a cultural thing it's a Sydney thing Um, if I was in Melbourne I would probably if not feel differently then I would be under some kind of pressure to feel differently because there's a, a, a much stronger culture in Melbourne for Melbourne bands, Melbourne music, a Melbourne feel, a Melbourne scene. And in Sydney, for various reasons, partly because it's a more diffused uh, area, um, but also because it's not as fixed on being different from somewhere else. There isn't the sense of needing to state constantly that you are from Sydney and um, you represent Sydney, and what you represent in Sydney is a particular Sydney thing. Mm. Um, so I, now I have issues with that, but I also see some value in that, um, both in Sydney and in Melbourne. I have issues with, with both approaches. I'm more comfortable with the Sydney approach of, of the music's the music, and I'm keen to hear what you do because you, what you're doing is good. 
it's not so much about where you're from, it's how good are the sounds that you're making. Yeah, and, and what it says about who you are and, and where you are, and where you are can be anywhere. Um, and if you're writing about Melbourne, you know, say Courtney Barnett writing about Melbourne, um, that's that's great, you're, but that's who you are. But if you're from Melbourne and you're not writing about Melbourne at all, that's fine as well. I mean, mm. why, why do you need... You don't need to represent Melbourne. You are from Melbourne. Um, and, of course, in the case of someone like Courtney Barnett, it's quite bizarre to claim her as Melbourne, given she grew up in Sydney for, what, 15, 16 years. Spent, she was born in Tasmania, wasn't she? Well, well she spent, spent the, next, the next eight years, I think, in Tasmania, yeah. and then moved to Melbourne. So, you know, where where do you draw the line? Um, where's the, hmm. the registration... Yeah. Where did she learn most things about music and yeah. identity? Who and, like who cares? I take right. your point entirely. And um, is that something that you've come to terms with as your career has progressed, or did you feel that way when you began writing about music? Well, that th- that uh, location is not so important. Yeah. Well, I, it wasn't a conscious decision. It was just um, I was conscious of Australian music uh, because obviously that's where I was, that's what I was seeing on a regular basis. The if I went to five gigs a week, almost every week it would be five Australian bands that I would be seeing. Um, so I was conscious of Australian bands, but I never felt um, some kind of um, loyalty to them or need to represent them in a special way when I started writing about music. Um, I just felt it was important that if it was a good, it was a good band, a good artist, I wanted people to hear them. Um, almost to contradict that Hmm. because you're not going to get as much attention as an Australian band a small Australian band and a a small Australian artist of any sort I feel a greater um, desire maybe to when I to promote that when I see something good when I but I would say that you could apply that to for example uh, women um you you know that it's much harder for women or indigenous artists or country artists uh, any category you want to break it down to to get through in a, a mainstream thing and and in a mainstream outlet like the Sydney Morning Herald it's I think even more important that I push some of those artists and um, they can be um, a folk act from the UK like the Young Thanks who I discovered 12 years or so ago and loved and thought people should hear about this or um, uh, someone who is making a, a record in, in Marlon Bibby it's just it's the kind of act that I want to keep pushing in the Herald because we have an avenue and we have an audience that actually picks up in certain areas not broadly but I know in certain styles of music and certain types of artists we can actually have an effect so I want to do that but I didn't establish that um, from the start and I didn't make a conscious decision to focus or not focus on Australian music that's just I just saw music out there that I wanted to talk about so you, you do feel some responsibility to champion music that perhaps wouldn't be covered by a mainstream paper like Sydney Morning Herald, if you think it's great and you think it's worth discussing, you'll review it almost as a way to give it more exposure and to introduce more people to it. Is that correct? Yeah, but because it's good, not because it's obscure Mm. um, or because it's not been in the Herald. It's not going to be in the Herald or the Australian or the Age or in mainstream places like that. Um, Because I think if it's good enough, then it doesn't matter that it's only going to sell 5,000. And which these days is actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, Sadly. But uh, because I I would like to hear it, and I know that there are other people who would like to hear it. Maybe not a lot, but I'd rather someone who's only going to sell five thousand sells a five thousand because someone like us gave him some encouragement. Mm. But someone who's going to sell a hundred thousand picks up another five thousand. Uh, big deal um, from reading the Herald. So. I feel a responsibility to give good music some exposure with what little help a place like the Herald can do. As I said, in some places it's no help, in some some other areas it can be quite substantial. We can actually turn people's careers around 
at a modest level, but it can happen. Tomorrow's panel is about music criticism, correct? That's so right. Just tell the listeners a bit about what's in store for that. Well, hopefully it won't be all about is there any value in music criticism. Um, I've been on a number of those panels for some years now, and um, there's, a, there's a place for that question. Um, in the age of the internet, when everyone wants a critic, what's the role of the critic? But I think um, this one's probably, hopefully, going to focus more on how we do it, why we do it and how we do it, and what, what the process is. Some of what I've been saying about um, how you choose things because that's a really important decision we make. And while I, I know that we have a small impact in lots of ways, and when people say, well, you're, you're writing for the Herald, so, okay, at its height, maybe we had a million readers, but of those million readers, a fraction would look to arts coverage. A fraction of that fraction cared about music, and a tinier fraction bought music would read every word of a review exactly. and influence their purchasing yeah. decisions and um you're there long enough and you build up enough of a name and reputation you can have some in, some influence but you're talking about a fraction of a fraction of a fraction so there isn't great influence but within the small pool that is music and within the small pool that's australian music there is definitely a chance to have some influence and i think um the decisions that are, that are behind that how you choose what gets covered why someone will get a feature review and somebody else will get a small review, why it will turn up in one section of the paper, the Friday uh, supplement, not the Saturday supplement, or the other way around. I think those are valid questions, and I hope that some of those questions questions like that will be what we'll cover in this, um, the reasoning behind it, and then also why we do what we do um, and what the motivation is, because in most cases, people who write about music aren't doing it for a career. Um, and if they think they're going to get a career out of it, they're deluded. Mm. Yeah. I've lucked into it. Um, and some of it was luck. Some of it was because I pushed hard for it and I established an area of the Herald and built on it uh, because initially the, we, we had quite fractured coverage. But um, it's, it's rare to have someone making money out of writing about music in Australia just as it's rare to have someone making money out of making music in Australia. Mm. Uh, and it's even rarer for that to be your full-time job and in in a place where you have a readership, um, a defined, a known readership, not just a let's hope that, that someone is coming across my blog mm. and, and taking notice. Your fellow panellists tomorrow include Noel Mengel, who up until recently was the music writer at the Korea Mail, and Dave Faulkner, who is a music critic for the Saturday Paper, probably better known for being a uh, frontman of Hoodoo Gurus, the band, but the person moderating the panel is also a former music journalist and a uh, singer-songwriter, Jake Stone from Blue Juice. Have you been kind to Blue Juice in your writing over the years, do you recall? <laughs> I record? have, actually, yes. Uh, I, I, and I was kind to Jake when he was writing. I gave him some work... Um, writing for the Herald as well mm -hmm. um, not because I liked Blue Juice but because I thought he was a smart guy with, with the talent for writing mm -hmm. and um, I liked Blue Juice not because I liked Jake's writing as a journalist but because I thought they were smart and funny and um, challenging in all the right ways and um, stupid in the right amount as well <laughs> so uh, the other people on the panel I think Dave I've, I think I've only ever written one mildly negative thing about the gurus and I don't think he remembers it <laughs> um, oh, might be a surprise <laughs> yeah, well, come at you. well I've, I've been I've been on a on the Australian Music Prize panel with, with Dave for 11 years now mm -hmm. I think we're the only two who've done all 11 years wow. of, the, of the app and um, he has yet to stab me accidentally with a with a sharp pen or you know, spill a drink on me repeatedly um, it was the first time for everything yeah, yeah that's right well maybe tomorrow i'll remind him that uh, i don't even remember what i said I, th I think i said that this album was was fine uh it was mac mac show uh, the make make show in german i think that album i thought was was fine not fantastic but but a perfectly good gurus record uh so that's, that's okay I, no i didn't describe 
it's not like it's Wolf Mother. <laughs> if I ever if I ever find myself on a panel with um, what's his name, Andrew Stockdale, Andrew Stockdale. Well, actually, you won't remember me because <laughs> it's like well, far too much dope to remember a name like mine. But uh, if I was to ever find myself on a panel with Andrew Stockdale, that would be an interesting one. Recently, about a year ago, when they reformed, or you know, when he reformed, when he started a new version of the band, I was approached by the publicist to uh, to do an interview, and um, the publicist had no idea. I said, "You should." You should read the review, the last the review I did of, of their second album, before you push this. And, oh no, no, it'll be fine. So I sent her the review, and she came. Okay, yeah, all right, maybe we won't. We'll That's do, very we'll do it. judicious or diplomatic. Or you could have taken the interview and torn them apart again. Ah, uh, yeah, but I would only tear them apart if I could see some value in it, hmm. and um, and only if everyone is aware of, of the situation. Um, if you're aware that I'm not a fan of the band, if you're a publicist and you're aware that I'm not a fan of the band in particular, but I'm happy to do the story and I'm approaching it not with the attitude of I don't like, I didn't like the band last time, and I'm going to test rips off them this time. Mm. Um, then, that, then if everyone's conscious of of what's happening, that's fine. Um, I'm not going to be deceitful. I'm not going to say I have no view on the band when I have a view on the band. But I'm also not going to say I'm going to be. Um, Test strips off you without hearing the album, um, not coming in with preconceptions or no. You, you know, as as much as you can. The the fact is, you we all have our preconceptions and we all have our prejudices, whether we know the band at, at all. You know, we, there are certain types of music and certain types of singers that that people react to, and I'm just the same. Um, but I would approach each album hopefully with a view of well this could turn me around. Mm. Um, and that's possible. And it's happened a number of times, for good and bad, mm -hmm. where people have shown me that, not that I was wrong necessarily previously, but that what I had issues with this last time aren't there this time, or they've found a way to convince me that what I had issues with last time um, can be, uh, they weren't insurmountable. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a view that my opinion is, un, is is fixed, but it's actually pretty rare, very rare, where I've looked at a review some years later and thought I was wrong. Hmm. Maybe be, not because I'm, I can't be wrong, but just that's how it felt at the time, and that was right. That's I responded as I responded at the time, and uh, so. For that reason, the review isn't necessarily wrong. But nor has it happened very often where I've gone back to an album that I hated and found myself liking now. Um, the more common is that I may have something that I really liked at the time I don't like so much anymore, um, and lots of reasons for that. But it's rare that I've downed an album and then come back and thought, actually, it's, it's there. I mean, the, the reasons I didn't like it tend to be the reasons that will stay with me yeah. for whatever reason. What is the gap between your first listen and your first reaction to an album versus what you end up giving in terms of the star rating and what ends up in the paper? Um, ideally, and it doesn't always happen, but ideally it would be at least eight to ten listens. Hmm. Um, and that, again, ideally would be over weeks, but could be condensed into three, four days, if need be. Uh, one of the few times when um, I think I got something wrong um, because, and so when I say wrong, where I think my judgment was, was affected, was a time when I had to listen to an album essentially over a weekend, and I know I went into it with, and I should say what it was, it was the Smiths' final album. And I went into it with the attitude of, I'm so excited. I'm finally going to review the Smiths album because the Smiths were a huge band for me. And I hadn't reviewed the earlier albums. And this album, great, I'm going to review it. And I listened to it over the three, four, um, two days and listened to it incessantly. And that has an effect anyway. Uh, if you immerse yourself in an album for 
10, 12 plays in a row, it, it affects you. Um, coupled with the fact that I was just excited to be reviewing the Smiths and I love the Smiths and my judgment, I think inflated the worth of that album. Hmm. Um, and not too long afterwards, I realized that that's what had happened. And it, and so this is 25 years ago, uh -huh. um, but it's one and of, it sticks in your mind. You're still yeah, remembering clearly. It, I still remember it clearly. And that's because it's, it's a, it's a lesson I've, I've held to, I've used for myself. Um, as a reminder that it's a really obvious thing, but you can, so many different things influence how you respond to an album, how you go into it, what you're, what you're doing, um, and how it dominates your, your overall experience. Um, and I think it's really important that you give an album a lot of listens, but it's also really important that you don't give the album exclusive lessons that you're not that that's not the only thing you experience that you have some space mm -hmm. that you step back from the album for a day maybe at least for a few hours and not hear it um, I have a process when I when I write reviews uh, and in an ideal situation this, does, this doesn't always happen sometimes you you have to turn around an album for an online review for example and that can that can be done on four straight listens and uh, that's frustrating but it's a fact of life mm. but the process I, I have this process that I try to go through with all of them my process begins with playing an album the first couple of times in the background um, while I'm writing something else cooking driving whatever I deliberately don't focus on it it's um, I'm listening to it and it's but it's just there in the background and that'll happen first two, three times maybe. Then I'll start f tuning in to more aspects of it. Noticing, for example, which things I'm recognizing from just having it in the background. The things that's, the things that lodge in your brain. The hooks, yeah. for want of a better the, term. The hooks, yeah. Um, or, yeah, the, the hooks in different forms. The sound, um, a particular element, uh, or um, you know, a guitar figure or whatever. And then... I try not to, if, if the lyrics are available, I don't pick up the lyrics until the fifth or sixth listen because I want to feel the lyrics first mm. and then clarify them. Um, and then I'll listen to it intently, focusing on it. So as it goes, the more, the more inten intense the focus becomes. And then I will put it on while I'm writing the review and again, so there it's in the background again. It's, it's gone from front of mind to back of mind, but I'm thinking about what I'm writing. And that I found is really interesting for me anyway, um, effect where sometimes my attitude changes at the writing stage. Hmm. I thought I knew what I was going to write. I thought I knew how I felt about the album, but having it on in the background while I'm writing, while I'm thinking through and writing, I think oh, well actually that doesn't that doesn't hold why why have I not noticed that before or why why is this thing that I thought was a perfectly good thing suddenly sounding wrong um, so by then we're talking you know maybe the 12th listen ideally ideally yeah. yes um, or more mm. uh, if if I can have it for weeks before I have to write something it's great mm. you know, I, I can I can really get to know something but in practical terms these days that doesn't work because um, you often don't get the music until a week or two weeks before sometimes yeah. less yeah I review albums for the Australian certainly not the frequency that you do maybe one a month on average and I love to have weeks if a month or more is great because it can just cycle through mm. and embed itself in your mind and you understand it better and it can therefore articulate yourself better yeah. the thought of having to cram uh an album into two days and then try to formulate something coherent it just fills me with dread to be honest yeah and there's the other thing too which is as you say I mean, you, uh, I'm doing I will do maybe four albums a week and if I'm doing a feature review so there might be three albums in that review uh, then I'll be doing another individual album and then a, uh, in say in Spectrum 
and maybe another album or two in shortlist and when we had the Sunday thing I might have been doing one there so that some weeks I might be writing up to six reviews in, in different different stars and different lengths but what, what are the, uh, the range what's the shortest and what's the longest uh, shortest is was 120 words which is just appalling mm-hmm. um, and the longest the longest these days is about 900 we did have a brief period where we were doing about 1600 words for a feature review that was heaven mm-hmm. um didn't last long of course Mm -hmm. Um, but having that many albums on the go uh, is is a questionable practice I know there are definitely I think I'm fine with it but I know there are people who think how can you do that it's just not it doesn't make any sense you're not focusing on it and if though if I was listening to if I was reviewing six albums that I was listening to in a, a week one week period it would be crazy it wouldn't work um, yeah. but for a start it's what I do it's what I've been doing for 30 years and so there are there are I, I have a facility for, for doing that um, whether I'm doing it well is another issue but I have a facility for doing that a, de- a practice that's developed um, but also those things are happening at a different they're all at different parts of the cycle um, and some of them are not albums that I'm get, that I need to listen to twelve times. Some of them are albums I'm listening to four times, mm. and sometimes you can tell straight away that this is an album that I know where I'm going with this album. I know what it's doing, and the fourth the fourth listen isn't going to isn't going to change it, or the fourth listen will be sufficient. Mm. Um, and there are other albums that you think four listens, I'm not even close, and so. Those albums I've been listening to over a period of time and they come up at different points in the cycle and are reviewed at different points. So mm. uh, some of that's self-justification. Mm. It's a, a practical thing. I have to do that many things. But also that's it's my full-time job, not just reviewing albums, but music is my full-time job. Mm. And music is my full-time passion. You know, I have music on at it... Um, almost every moment whenever of the you're day awake that, that doesn't involve um, that doesn't involve watching TV uh, yeah. so uh, people who live with me are renewed to the to the sound often enough and in fact some, they, they will sometimes say that they I said but I was playing that album weeks ago but I, we don't know we don't we just tune your music out because the music's on you know, the, the morning the music's on over breakfast the music's on through the day the music's on over dinner um, the, there's there's a music player of some sort in every room in the house. Um, Do you get fatigued? No, not not really. Um, there, I mean, there are times when I say I have music on all the time. There actually are times when I I have silence, but it's not often. And I don't get fatigued so much as there are times when I just can't be bothered with something that isn't that good. And so it's not fatigue it's just a decision that this isn't worth my time and um and that happens at at live gigs where i'm standing there thinking okay this is i'm 35 minutes into the show you're going to play a 70 minute show and another 10 minutes of encore and i know everything about what you're doing and this is really bad i want i want to get out of here (laughs) um then i get fatigued um but again, that's that's more lack of engagement with me or by me than um, fatigue. I still, I have no um, no sense yet that I'm going to run out of excitement about music. I I know some people who who gave up listening to new music and are still writing about music. Hmm. Uh, there's a, a former colleague of mine who worked at couple of papers and it was clear that he'd stopped caring about music that he wasn't interested in in new music occasionally there would be something that interested him but his general attitude was it's all been done and this isn't really that good mm. and, um, and I thought why are you still writing about music jaded yeah um, jaded and and wrong mm. because if you're jaded you should stop but if you decided that there is nothing more that's really going to excite you and that's that's not necessarily jaded. That's that's 
you know, you've reached that point in your life where you can't take any more. Um, your mind doesn't really want any more. Then you've got to stop. You shouldn't be doing it. On the other hand, I still get excited by finding new music, old music, new music. I still thrill at reading something in a uh, international magazine about for example um, a couple of years ago I, I was reading there was a little a little snippet in mojo by one of the guys in fleet foxes man guy i think talking about an album by um a man i'd never heard of who hardly anyone knew and i thought well i love what you do what you're saying is interesting I put an order and I bought it and it arrived and this guy Jimmy Spheris and exactly what I wanted to hear it was great and I was really excited to hear it's not the best album ever but it's a really good record that did nothing in 1973 or whenever it came out mm. and probably sold five more copies since mm. probably by people like me reading the, this guy mm. um, but that's that's exciting or hear the new Drones album and think it's a band that still gets me excited and still makes me feel really uncomfortable and excited because I'm uncomfortable. Um, or hearing a new uh, a, a new artist like... Um, oh, my God, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head, but you know, I, I still, I'm still getting excited by all of those things. So I'm not tired of hearing music. I'm not tired of finding new music. And I still want so much more I want to learn. Now, there's still whole areas of music that I that I want to know more about, and um, both in terms of the, the the broad music that I cover, which is pretty much anything that isn't jazz and classical, uh, but also in jazz, for example, and you know, I I still there's still areas there that I'm huge areas there that I don't know anything about. Blind spots. Yeah. Everyone's got them, of course. Well, I mean, with jazz, it's not even blind spots, and, and classical music, it's not blind spots. It's sort of huge valleys that uh, that I haven't yet found a path into. Mm. But uh, there's still so much. And I still get I get a thrill going to see the ACO play and um, Australian and Chamber Australian Orchestra. Chamber Orchestra playing um, uh, uh, composers that I know I've heard of, but but don't know. And then seeing their offshoot, um, ACO Underground, who play a mix of avant-garde and non-classical music, um, whether it's pieces by Johnny Greenwood or actual um, popular music elements that they that they bring, and I learned so much not just from the music but the combination, the 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 patterns that are or the connections that are made by by Richard Tognetti, who has a a much broader music interest and knowledge than a lot of uh, classical uh, performers and, and um, orchestra members. So I'm sitting there thinking, how, how did he get from, from Bartok to um, and Messian and then back up to, um, to, to Johnny Greenwood? What, what are the connections? So it's, it's got me thinking. And, I wouldn't necessarily write about it, though actually I write a lot about ACO Underground, even though every time I go see them I think, I really shouldn't be doing this, this really should be being done by a classical composer, a complete classical composer, a classical um, reviewer. Hmm. But then I come back from, from the, those shows and I'm thinking, well that was really interesting, those elements, how did, how did that work? And I wouldn't have thought that this composer uh, was a natural fit with this composer. So. I'm still getting excited by it. I'm not Clearly, excited no, it, now. It's really inspiring to hear, to be honest, because I, I began as a music journalist and critic running for street press and then for websites like The Vine and Mess and Noise. And for the first couple of years of my freelance career, I was reviewing and interviewing musicians just on a constant cycle, constant loop. And to be honest, it burnt me the fuck out. Yeah. Like, I found that I had no time to listen to music mm. that I reliably enjoyed. It was always just listening to the new stuff, trying to form opinions, and then file that review onto the next one. And yeah. it drove me crazy. That's why I had to uh, expand my horizons from writing up music into general interest journalism, I suppose. Yeah. So I'm really uh, inspired to hear that you have maintained your interest and you're still excited to hear new stuff. Yeah, um, 
because it's really easy it would be really easy to fall into into that uh, that feeling you describe of, of just I have no way I'm not getting perspective anymore because it's I'm just churning through uh, and I, that's why I think it's really important I, I have a, a general rule it's not hard and fast draw but I have a general rule for example uh, though I mentioned I will listen to, to things in the car but generally speaking in the car I don't listen to new music in the car it's it's often sort of eight hour mixtapes that I make <laughs> and uh, there there will be new things but there will be old things there will be everything and all kinds of styles in there uh, because that's that's my non-review brain Um, I can listen to it and I'm hearing and I can hear different things and I use those elements when I'm reviewing elsewhere but that's not that's not work that's Mm. that's just just that that experience and um, similarly at home I will usually be playing new things but I also make a point of of, um, not exclusive uh, listening to new things because you need perspective and uh, you need to be thinking about other things and I need I will I need to go out and see things that isn't that not, that's not music and I need to be reading things that's not music um, but I also need to have the music I'm listening to be out of a cycle not locked in because otherwise as you say you you, just, you end up thinking if it's Tuesday, I must be reviewing blah. Hmm. Um, and so where's, where's the freshness? Where's, where's the new way of thinking about something? And it's not going to happen if you're, in, if you're locked in. And that's, that's one of the toughest things, I think, is still finding new ways to talk about it. New, new reference points, but new, um, new language to... To talk about music in a way that doesn't just sound like, first of all, it could have been written 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, that it doesn't sound like something you wrote yourself a year or two ago. Because the music's not quite the same, and people reading it aren't the same. And most people are reading it really have no idea what I wrote a year ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most people don't, don't follow bar lines. But even the people who do, might recognize some tropes in my writing but hopefully they don't feel like everything I write is written in the same way and is approached the same way because you shouldn't you shouldn't approach every record uh, with the same idea that um, you know, it needs to do this and it needs to do that and if it doesn't do that it's a failure if it does do that it's a success you know? so that's just a really minor example but you, if you can't keep refreshing your approach to music the music won't be fresh either yeah I, I read you in the Sydney Morning Herald on Saturdays in Spectrum generally either in the features or in the, the smaller capsule reviews or whatever they're called at the Spectrum uh, page layout but I certainly don't get the sense that there's a formula to a Vernon to the review like sometimes you, you honestly surprise me with the way that you just frame an album it's like it's sometimes it's very conversational sometimes you take a bit of a more analytical step back like mm. you, you for me as a reader you keep it interesting constantly yeah because otherwise I'm born I'd bo- be boring myself and I don't I write for me before I write for anybody else mm. and if I'm not interested no one's going to be interested um, so when I say I write for myself I'm I'm that doesn't mean I'm not conscious of the fact that, that there are people reading me who, who will be reading me every week and I don't want them thinking that they that they can make a judgment on, on something. First of all, a judgment on the style of the music. They say, well, he will only... He's not going to like this because it's a hard rock band and doesn't normally like hard rock. Well, actually, sometimes I do. Mm. I don't want you thinking that, if I, that I will start a review by telling you that it does this and does that or that I will start the review by some anecdote or you know, feature piece. So... I want you to be surprised and I want because I want to be surprised Mm. no you're doing well I keep it up (laughs) in that regard how do you I mean maybe you just touched on this but how do you keep it right how do you keep music criticism fresh like when do you know how you're going to 
begin a review? Is it not until you sit down on the keyboard and start typing that it starts to formulate in your mind? Not uh, sometimes, um, and particularly bigger reviews. As, as with feature stories, um, sometimes they will come, they will come fully formed. I will know as I'm listening to a record or I'm listening to an interview how the story is going to go. Um, I know how I want to start. I know the idea I want, or I know how I want it to end. If I've got the the last line. Um, and then I've just got to build to it. I've got to find a way to get to it. <laughs> but I don't have, I don't know how it's going to work, what approach, until I'm sitting there, my hands at the keyboard. Actually, these days I don't have my hand on the keyboard because I do voice recognition. Because, oh, wow. uh, that's another issue altogether. Um, but it is effectively my hand at the keyboard and start thinking about it. Um, and then the sense uh, say with a, a live review sometimes a live review will will come to me while I'm watching the show and I think okay I want to I want to talk about the way that this has happened and it's going to be a chronological exploration um, exploration of the show but often often enough it will be the next morning occasionally straight after the show but it's usually the next morning I will be sitting there thinking, what's the theme? Because my my reviews, live reviews and major reviews, album reviews, there has to be some idea. What's the thread? Otherwise, it's just a, they did this, they did this, and it went well and it didn't go well. Um, and that's fine. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it's the only thing to do. But I want generally want to have an idea. What is it that sums up that show for me? And so for me, live reviews, sometimes I have a, a live review that doesn't mention a single song. Mm. And um, and that can seem a bit odd. Sometimes people say to me, well, did they play this and this? I said, uh, sometimes I'm not even sure. I've got to go back, I'll go back to my notebook mm. and where I generally write every song that's the that least I can identify. But there, then there are other reviews where I will not list every song, but... I might mention 10 songs because it's a it's a context and then there are reviews where I will focus on lyrics which generally speaking would be more common in in a in an album review than a live review mm. but sometimes either because of the way the show is performed or because the lyrics amplify the, the theme I have I might focus heavily on the lyrics so mm. it comes down to where my head or heart or hands are at when I sit down to do it. Do you take a notebook to live shows? Yeah. Always have? Always. Yeah. There's uh, maybe three or four times when my pen's run out. (laughs) I know I should take a second pen, but almost always I don't have a second pen and I've (laughs) put it in my phone. Uh, But I don't, I prefer a notebook, even though the stupid thing with me with notebooks is my handwriting is appalling. (laughs) I'm writing a small notebook in the dark <laughs> and so um, I will look back at my notes the next morning and I have no idea did a drunk man write these words yes. <laughs> what was it? what what's this I don't know mm. um, but I, I do it because it makes me think through the show um, writing it down puts clarifies the idea or or allows the idea out that maybe the back of my mind it's a half formed idea mm. and writing it down solidifies it enough so it's it's there and maybe I'll amplify it uh, when I sit down later um, and sometimes I have what I think is a really good line it's what I want to say about them uh, and so I'll put it down because otherwise it's gone yeah. you can't trust your, your memory no. um, but often the bulk of what I'm writing is just the songs. It's the song title. and But then the next morning, I, won't, I may not look at my notebook at all. I mean, many times when I've written a review without looking at my notebook, it's there in front of me, and I could flick through, but I have I already know what I want to say, because I've thought about it. I've thought about it overnight. Um, I thought about it during the show, and it's out, and it just it, it pours out. But then other times I'm sitting there trying to think, I, I don't know. If I, can't, if I don't have a concept... But I don't have a theme. 
it's really hard to write a review. Mm. Um, as you know, like most most people, if I don't have a beginning, I can't I can't go on. <laughs> I sometimes we'll jot down, we'll write down a paragraph or two that I know is going to fit somewhere in there, but it, that, that review is not going to happen until I have the opening paragraph. Even if it's a bad opening paragraph, and I can then move on and write the rest of the review, and then come back and refine that opening paragraph. But if I don't have an opening, my brain just won't allow me to write on. Right. Do people at live shows ever notice you writing in your notebook, and do they ever say anything to you? Yeah. What kind of things do you get? Um, what are you doing? <laughs> Who are you reviewing for? Oh, the Herald. Right. Um, and. And very occasionally they'll say, oh, I, you know, I, know, I, know, I know who you are. and um, But they're usually just curious why, what, what am I writing? And they, they want to, they'll ask me or they'll look. And it's brilliant. <laughs> and so I can't read that <laughs> shit. <laughs> go, go hard. <laughs> See if you can work it out. Um, but it's a small notebook and I'm relatively unobtrusive. That's another reason why I prefer to use a notebook than, than the phone because I don't want this light ex- um, in distracting people from the show. I yeah. try, try to be as unobtrusive to mm. the show, to other people. Um, and uh, uh, it's also the physical aspect of writing the notes. It's just, I think, the phys- as I said before, about, about putting solidified, solidifying the idea of writing it, a physical thing firms the idea up in in my mind hmm. um, gives me a connection to to it it's not just a, a, a vague thing that's often about in my head it's actually a, a practical thing hmm. um, but most people just look at me a bit odd uh, as a, a, this odd person standing next to me. this little notebook here and you know it's it's literally in the p- size of my palm and I'm doing this sort of thing and it's, it's just an odd person standing there these days, it, um, people, I got a letter the other day, or a letter to the Herald, um, saying that they know, they saw me there with my notebook scribbling away, so they knew there was going to be a review, and they're wondering about why something else wasn't reviewed, and I thought, that's one of the problems with uh, uh, the move over the past 10, 15 years to identify reviewers, put your face up on things. I think it's a <laughs> terrible thing, I never liked it. Mm. Um, but it puts you, people start, Noticing, and also if you're there, go to as many shows as I do, and, and um, people who go to the same style of shows um, will will see you turn up there. They'll they'll know. Um, Your name's on the door, also. Yeah. Some people at the door know. Yeah. Is there a viewer card? Most of them have no idea. Yeah. You know, it's just, which is why sometimes I've sat, I've been standing there saying, "No, really, I, th- um, I know you can't see my name there, but I'm certain that would that my name should be there." And and they say, no. fuck off, mate. We've heard that one before. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I have walked away. Recently, I, I, um, I went to see Ron Sexsmith at um, Newtown Social Club. And I went up to the door and, no, no name. Uh, said, the Herald, no. Okay, just because I'm, I'm meant to be reviewing it. No. Fine. You know, I'm, I'm not going to harass this person just doing a job but I'm not on the list I'm not on the list no. not going to do the whole don't you know who I am no and f- because they don't know who I am <laughs> they're usually they're usually someone around 22 they don't read the Herald they don't mm. give a shit who I am and uh, plenty of people are trying to scan their way into shows yeah. um, so I, I didn't do it but I, I tweeted that I was leaving the place because uh, my name wasn't on the door it's a shame I love Ron Sexsmith I reviewed him every time he's come out to Australia every album he's done blah, blah. not that I said this but you know, I was disappointed mm. um, and Ron happened to be on Twitter at that time and um, I, I did in the, in, in the tweet say you know, put in his handle handle um, obviously quite deliberately I, I don't know that I consciously said well this he'll see it and later he'll go oh well I should have let him in um, I certainly wasn't expecting him to look at them but I, I did it um, obviously with some sense of it and as I was back at my car just about to reach my car he he tweeted in response I'll look, come back are you still there uh, I said no no I've gone I said, look I'm, I'm sending my wife down who does his merch and, and <laughs> co-managers I think down to put you on the list they come back 
Um, <laughs> so I came back and, and the people in the door were a little perplexed why this person who they'd sent away a few minutes, 10 minutes ago was back and had they been told, put, put his name on the door. Um, wow. <laughs> um, but that was mainly because I have a long relationship of sorts with, with Ron Sexsmith. You know, I wrote the first things about him in Australia. Hmm. And so my name had stuck in his mind. I've interviewed him enough times so that he, he would actually remember the name. Hmm. Uh, but otherwise that show wouldn't have happened. That <laughs> review wouldn't have happened. Right. Why did you prefer anonymity as a reviewer? Why are you perturbed when your face appears next to your byline? Well... I, I, I like the idea, I, I'm quite happy to have my name in the paper, but I don't see it necessary to have people standing next to me know that I'm person X from, from publication. It's, um, it's a cult, it's a step further in, the, in a cult of personality that there's no real logic to it. I mean, if I'm happy to have my, my name there, what's the problem with having my, my, face, my face there? But I quite like not being recognised as the person reviewing. So people then don't come up and say anything. Um, or <laughs> as, I'm trying to listen to the music. Shut yeah, up. Or alternatively, you know, very occasionally I've had people buttonhole me over something that, that they didn't like. Hmm. Um, but I think we're not... I'm doing a job, and it's an important job. I treat it as an important job. But it's not... It shouldn't be about... about my head uh, there's no logic to it I just you know it's, I, I can't look at myself on TV so every time I do a TV thing I don't look you know, I once I was in a um, in a couple of docos um, I think Triffids was one and it was screening it screened at a at a festival I was watching and I had to look I was sitting and I couldn't leave the cinema but I couldn't look at myself I had to I could hear which is bad enough I was listening to myself and uh, luckily I was thinking all oh, right you actually sound okay you, <laughs> you you're all right but I can't look at myself so seeing myself on TV or seeing my face in the paper is just you know, it's, it's not what it, it's just not who I am there's too, no too much yeah it's got it's not it's not about it's, it's not self-effacing it's just sheer discomfort at looking at myself <laughs> what misconceptions do people tend to have about your job as a music writer <laughs> The biggest one is also based on, on the truth that it's the best job. And it is. It's the best job. Because it's the best job for me because I'm doing... I'm getting paid to do something that I love and am immersed in. So it's great. But people think that it's a relatively straightforward job. You write, You like music, you write about music. And the people... It's not just the general public; it's other journalists who think this. Mm, um, in the newsroom, man. in the newsroom, um, many people have come up to me over the twenty-four years I've been at the Herald, um, or so twenty-two years since I've been focusing on on music, and say the past ten or so years when it's been almost exclusively music, and said, "I like music. I like like to review." Um, I said, "Okay, that's not going to happen." You're not going to. They want to do live reviews because they've gone to gigs and they want to get all the free tickets. Yeah. Well, it's not. It doesn't work. Just because you like music doesn't mean you can write about music. People think that it's just a straightforward matter of you like music, it's easy. You write and you say whether you like something or not, and it's down to the stars, uh, which I hate. Uh-huh. I hate star ratings even more than I hate, I hate having my face oh, in right. the paper. Let's dwell on that for a moment. Um, why do I hate it? For the reason most reviewers, not all. Most reviews had that it's so inaccurate. It's not what I've been saying. It's in an ideal world, I'm telling you about something, and I'm not a consumer service. I'm I'm not a product tester. I'm not saying this this um, this does seventy percent of something else. <laughs> um, and the idea that my thoughtful hours spent constructing this thing trying to give you a sense of how this works and why this works and what they were trying and 
uh, what's the background, their background, and what are the cultural connections, and what are the historical connections? Can we boil down to so it's a two and a half or three stars or three and a half? Um, and three and three stars means I might buy it. Four stars means you've got to buy it. Five stars, it's the best album of all time. Um, two and a half stars, or you you, you gave um, say Megan Trainer two and a half stars, and you gave. Um, um, underworld underworld god two and a half stars see if that was going to happen but so <laughs> you're saying that uh, or you gave underworld two and a half stars and you gave megan train to three stars so megan train is a better album no it's not read the review and you'll see why <clears throat> that's happened in the context of this band this is an ordinary album in the context of this artist this is a good album this is what they're trying to do, what they've done, what they're capable of. They've done well. Mm. Um, but instead, it's two and a half, it's three, it's three and a half. So they're all being measured by the same scale, whereas you're talking about within the scale of an artist's career, like Underworld, a certain album might be not quite as good as something they've done before, yeah. whereas a new artist... Yeah, I, and, I see and, what you're and, saying. And different expectations. And, and you don't you don't measure everything the same way you don't measure everything against um, everybody else I don't expect a first album from a young band to have the complexity of a fourth album from artists in their in their 30s unless of course they're uh, unless you're talking um, oh what's her name uh, Laura Marling who's just appallingly um, fantastic and her her second album when she was still only what 19 was had more depth than most 35 year olds will get in their careers worth of albums appallingly was that the right use of the word then? Appa- it's appalling it shouldn't be allowed that someone, <laughs> is, that someone is that good and that good that young and that consistently good uh, I'm you know, uh, a huge huge fan of hers I, she's one of the few people I will make the kind of ridiculous statements that any music critic should never make of the I think she is capable of being the Joni Mitchell of, of her generation. And I, I don't talk about New Dylans and New Jonies, and she's not the new Joni, um, but she's capable on f- four or five albums she's made of being one of those significant artists. And you can see that by the time she's 40 and made 12 albums, that there will be this substantial body of work that will stand as, as a major artist. Um, but you know, I I avoid saying that too often. And back to the stars, I I've given maybe five five star reviews for shows and albums in twelve years, thirteen years, how long we've been doing it. Wow. And um, I'm surprised that I'd even have that many because for me, and that's it. Most of those have happened in the past four or five years mm. as I've loosened a bit. Mm. But I had a an unofficial strict rule that I was going to give five stars because five stars left nowhere, yeah, nowhere to go, mm-hmm. um, and it would take a pretty special album or a pretty special concert. But then I realised that okay, there are some moments you know, judging it on a on on its on its elements, not on its context uh, with other things. Sometimes a perfect moment is a perfect moment particularly in a, sh- in a live show. So I actually mm. gave, I've given five stars to a few live shows, a few more live shows than I have to two albums. Mm. But I'm still instinctively uh, recoiling from, from giving something five stars, mm. which then frustrates me because I think, I don't want to talk about, I want you to read the review and think, this is, so this is what the album's about. This is how it connects with the, the reviewer has connected with this. Um, what does it say to me? Why Why might I find this interesting? That's what I want you to take away from the review, not looking at the stars. And as soon as the stars are there, and I do it as well, as soon as the stars are there, that's what you look at. Yeah. And you think, okay, it's a three-star album. Midling, will, I, will I read this review to yeah. learn more? Or it's already coloured coloured your, your thinking. Yeah. Um, I think if you're going to have stars, drop them at the bottom of the review <laughs> I'd still end up going there probably yeah, yeah, yeah. but when the star rating is the first thing you see it's already coloured how you read in the review and it, it's 
but worst of all, it's made the review almost irrelevant because it's a uh, it's a consumer warning. This is a bad album, or this is a great album. Um, instead of this is why this album is a success or not a success, and it's not as simple as um, it's a great album. It's it's more complex than that because the art that you're critiquing is more complex than that. But that, then you do a 120 word review and what are you going to say in 120 words? Mm. Sometimes the star rating is both a curse and a boon for doing something like that. Okay, I can't, I can't really t- tell you too much about this album. It has four good songs, it has two excellent songs mm. and um, it's in this, in this style, four stars. And there, take mm. it away, go listen to it and, <laughs> yeah. you know, online and see where it goes. Is there, you you mentioned that you don't, or maybe you you try not to view the pages or the reviews as like a consumer warning or recommendation service. Mm. Do you think that there is a value in uh, a well-written negative review? Yes, though what the value is, is is debatable or uh, would be viewed differently by different people. I think... The, a, a negative review is valuable for the reason I don't like stars ratings and that it's it's a discussion it's setting up an ex, an explanation of what this album was trying to do or what this concert set out to do um, and uh, did it succeed in, in its in its aims on one that's that's one one element what is it that's been discussed in the, in this album what is it that what's the emotional context what's the emotional core of this album what's the intellectual core of this album mm. what are the connections between those and the physical the practical presentation of the music a negative review can have you think about why you like a particular artist and you're reading somebody's negative review and you're thinking I don't like what you're saying, um, but it's interesting that that's the approach you've taken. And this may make me think about it differently. It may stop me buying the album. That's not my goal. I'm not, I'm not trying to stop you buying a record. Mm. I'm just explaining to you how I've responded to it. And I think in an ideal world with a bit of space, more than 150, 180 words, 180 words for the small reviews we do now is tolerable, but no mm. more than that. In a proper length review, I'm giving you a broad discussion of, of a record, and um, my negative response to it isn't the final word. It's just the next step. Your response to it, first of all, your response to my review mm. is next step, then your response to the record itself. And then the artists, in very rare occasion, may be responding to it, but, but more importantly, responding to their own work next time gives that some context as well mm. and there's there's value in a negative review if you think that it's not a question of the negative review saying this is rubbish but saying this is uh, a reflection of these issues that are problems in either the songwriting or the performance or the conceptualizing of this record um or the context in which this record has been heard, mm. or this is this is an issue I'm having. I can't connect with this album, and this is why I can't connect with this album. You, on the other hand, will listen to it and may have a completely different approach. I'm explaining to you why it hasn't connected for me, mm. and you can look at that. And if you're someone who generally, and you know, I know this happens, you generally think I'm an idiot and I get things wrong. And you look at something and say, well, these are all the things that he doesn't like about it. I'm probably going to like it because I generally disagree with him. Or alternatively, okay, I can see what he's talking about here. I'm, I'm, this may give me some understanding about what I'm not... I've heard this album as well, and it's not quite working for me. I don't, and I can't articulate why. This is giving me some, some context. I may not agree with it necessarily, but here's some discussion, some to and to and fro uh, with the writer the reader and the uh, the artist mm. 
How did you start writing about music, Bernard? Um, a friend of mine, uh, who's he's a, he's a, a musician and, a, and an academic. When we were ten, eleven, started listening to music together, and we spent many, many years through our teens listening to music and talking about girls. And since there were almost no girls in my life, it was all so much music and you know, we, we would read um, the English magazines to a certain extent though I've always had a, um, a bit of resistance to the English approach to, to music writing um, and RAM magazine in particular in Australia devoured that and we would talk about it and, and um, after high school when I decided I, was, I wanted to be a journalist and then did law because I thought I was kidding myself I can't, can't really write I've got marks for law, let's do law. But John and I were sitting there one day and um, strongly disagreeing with the review by um, another writer who turns out was the same age as us and has subsequently become a good friend of mine. We ended up working together years later at the Herald. Wow. Um, John Kazimer. Uh, strongly disagreeing with him and, and having a bit of a rant about how can he be so wrong and he was so wrong last time I thought well, we should we should write it we should write a review and um, I don't know if we'd had a few drinks but uh, John didn't but I went out next week and um, there was new everything but the girl album and I bought it listened to it wrote a review and um, was going to take it in oh, I didn't know what I was going to do but I was going to give it to Ram and then bloody John Casimir he wrote the review of everything but because he was already writing for them he knew them mm. he was he was in there so I thought that, that's it it's not gonna, it's not going to happen like this I have to think of another way and this is back in the days of import record stores where you could go to uh, to the store pay a little extra and get a, an album they may not come out in Australia for months mm. it was already available in the States so I bought um the REM album uh, Fables of the Reconstruction and it was going to, it was out in two weeks in Australia I think two or three weeks so I bought it took it home spent the week and the weekend and the following Monday so did you ask how did I start or why? I mean I asked, I asked how but we can go into why <laughs> well uh, why is because I wanted I wanted to say these things that I, he, he and I were talking about and and correct some of the egregious errors of this <laughs> bloody John Casimir yeah. among others um, but also because all these people I was reading John and, and um, Wanda Jam Rosick and, and Phil Stafford and um, uh, Frank Brunetti uh, uh, God the the, um, the Brown sisters um, from Melbourne and loving what they were doing and thinking talking about music writing about music how, how good uh, love to do it but not actually can get into the idea of doing it myself until we were having these discussions mm. and so anyway I bought the Fables of the Reconstruction wrote a review and at that point I'd actually dropped out of the law I was working in the city and um, across, in, across Sydney. in Sydney yes across the park from East Sydney where the RAM offices were I'd never been there but I typed up typewriter sheet of paper this review of Fables of the Reconstruction and in my lunch hour, I walked across the park, and the plan was I was just going to drop this review in. It wasn't even an envelope. It was holding in my hand. <laughs> what was I thinking? Um, I was 20, and I was going to drop it in their inbox or letter box, whatever, whatever they had. I don't know what they had. And um, trotted over there, went up to their offices. It's cheap, rickety stairs, and, and uh, I was greeted at the door by this tall bloke, Englishman and uh, turned out it was Lyndon Barber again someone I've been reading both in the English papers and now uh, in Australia and I shut myself hmm. I'm talking to Lyndon Barber and um, anyway he's standing at the door holding my review in my hand reading it I'm thinking this is not how it's supposed to work <laughs> I was meant to interact with a human being yeah and I'm trying to edge my way out of this conversation before he reads it and, it, it, and too late he's reading and he says yeah right We'll run that next week. Gee. And Great strike rate, 100%. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and 
okay, great. And I left. Went back to the office. And, uh, what happened? Uh, how did that happen? Did I just get... And sure enough, the next issue, it appeared in there. And I thought, it's all right. With your byline. With my byline. It's in RAM. And my friends, cause all my musician friends and, and, and uh, you know, music-loving friends saw it in there. And I thought, maybe I could do it again. So I did a, a few more. But I did it because at that point, I didn't think there was a career in it. It's, I love music, I could write, I had opinions, and I was still, at that point, it was a few years before I woke up to the fact that, that um, I wasn't as knowledgeable or as smart as I thought I was. But I was 20, thought everyone knew everything. Yeah. Um, I thought I could give it a try. And, um, and maybe I could do this as an adjunct to, to my other work, because my plan was, at that point, to actually go into journalism full time. Um, but you know, proper journalism, not not music journalism, <laughs> grown up newspaper journalism. Yeah. Um, actually, How ironic! Yeah. How ironic! Yeah. Um, and so, I did it because I wanted to talk about music, and um, I, if, if I'd had girlfriends, I probably wouldn't have written because <laughs> I was writing songs with with John, and they're all about not having girls. And I was talking about music because I didn't have girls. So, mm. you know, thank you. Vicious cycle. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, something changed at some point. You, got, yeah. you are married. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I am married. Yes. I finally did start talking to girls. <laughs> well, All girls started talking back. You, uh, so you became a freelance music writer yeah. at that point. Yeah. What was the progression from RAM to whatever else? Well, I, was, I, I also started writing for the street press at that point, on the street. Um, <laughs> occasionally under an utterly ridiculous name when I um, had extra extra material for a RAM story that could go elsewhere. <laughs> so I read under the name Andre B. Rakim. Yeah, I thought it was so street. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I did, did work for Street Press and RAM. And then I got a call from, um, from Rolling Stone. Had it just had restarted. Uh, it had been dormant for a couple of years. And they asked me to do, to do some some things. One of which was uh, an interview with Steve Kilby, previous guest of Penmanship Podcast. Check it out, listeners. And a significant figure, uh, influential figure in in my music world, um, and in my lyric writing when I was writing lyrics. I mean, Kilby, Kilby Costello, and Morrissey were the probably the biggest influences on my lyric writing and to a fair extent on my general writing. Um, so, I, so I got a call from Rolling Stone, sure, to that, and that was great, and did some, they started doing some pieces for them, and then I, I got a call from the editor of um, Metro at the City Morning Herald, again, who asked me if I'd like to, to write some things for them. So I did that, and at that point I was then pitching elsewhere in the paper, and I Know, pitch to the features page, the agenda page it was called then, um, unofficially the women's page, um, and wrote some pieces for them. And so I was writing for RAM until it, it died, owing me money, but not <laughs> as much as other people. Yeah. Um, and Rolling Stone, occasionally on uh, Street Press, which I tried not to do because you never got better writing for Street Press. There was no, no, one, no one to critique your work, no one to, to fix things up, and of course you paid shit. And um, I could write elsewhere for a little bit of money, and I was so I had a full time job and doing this as a almost almost a full time job writing for as many of these people, and I was earning a reasonable amount of money, uh, certainly for my age at that time. Um, and then went overseas, and the plan was to go overseas for a couple of years, and uh, my then girlfriend, her wife. And I were going to travel for about nine months and then base ourselves in London and I was going to get some work as, as a journalist because I could write and I've been writing for these magazines. Yeah. Um, apparently there were several thousand other people <laughs> in London who thought the same thing and I knew they were there but I didn't realise just quite how out of, um, out of the market I was because even though I've been writing for several years at that point and I, and I was a perfectly capable writer... I'd been freelancing. I'd never worked at a in 
uh, in a magazine or newspaper and I applied for several jobs and I actually got an interview for a BBC job but um, no, it wasn't happening. I was writing pieces for the Herald um, TV stories. I was lining myself up some interviews and writing them, hand writing them in, in our little bedsit and then going down to the phone on the corner at one or two o'clock in the morning, mm. phoning copy back to copy takers the Herald had then. Um, so that was fine, <laughs> but it wasn't, get, it wasn't getting me anywhere. And um, I thought, well, I'm not gonna stay here. I don't wanna pull beers. Uh, running low on money and um, thought I'd come back and I'm going to this this is it uh, one of the reasons I've been freelancing instead of looking for full-time work is I was saving to go overseas so doing full-time job plus the freelance writing was giving me gave me enough money to send me overseas for at least a year mm. and um, so I came back to Australia and started looking for work as a journalist and I, the, a couple of places a couple of magazines um, one offered me a job as an editor, which I was tempted to do, but I thought, this is stupid. I've never worked in a magazine or newspaper and you want me to edit because you know, I was going to be cheap and, and whatever. But I applied for a job at a suburban paper in Penrith, out of Sydney, and amazingly got the job. Um, and actually more amazing than getting the job, is that I got the job at a graded journalist of all. I didn't, because I'd never done a cadetship. Uh, she took my experience and um, perceived quality <laughs> and gave me, hired me as, as a greater journalist. And uh, so I did that for three years. At that point, I stopped writing about music because that, that's when I thought <clears throat> I need to, I need to be better. And um, I've got a full-time writing job now. So I may not have as much time to write anyway, but also I need to be better. So I'm gonna learn how to write for a newspaper, but I'm gonna stop writing about music and I just went out and just, I'd always bought, I would buy 100 albums, 120, 150 albums a year. Mm. And um, I was kept doing that and I just read a lot and played a lot of music and just broadened my knowledge. Um, what kinds of things were you writing about at the Penrith paper? Oh, Everything, um, sport, politics, oh. um, you know, local government, state politics. So you're like um, a general reporter. Yeah, um, and the first year I was, you know, I was the the junior reporter. By the third year, I was the senior reporter, and so, and I was doing a little bit of arts coverage. So it's a spur pap, you do everything. So I was reviewing theatre at the Q Theatre. Mm. Um, didn't actually do any music, um, except maybe a, a small profile. But it was a broad training. It, it was effectively my cadetship, but working at a um, slightly higher level. Mm. Um, but I took that job. When I was offered that job, I, I looked at the comparative pay rates. And even though I'd gone in as a greater journalist, I was going to be taking a cut of about 40, 40%, 50% in, in income. It happened to be the year I was getting married as well. We'd mm. come back from overseas, you had no money, um, and we we're moving in and um, getting married on half the money I'd been earning before. But I didn't care. I was actually being a journalist, and, and you know, if I'd ever thought about doing journalism for money, um, which I, it did never occur to me to, um, that quickly disabused me of any notion of that as a, as a smart thing. Yeah, right. So what was the uh, transition from the Penrith paper to what came next? Uh, next was Sydney Morning Herald, uh -huh. um, where in my second year there, my editor, who's one of the most influential people in my life, um, she said to me, you should, should apply for the Herald. I can't, uh, no, I, can't not, I can't go there. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, but in my third year, I thought, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I applied for a job and uh, got an interview, which was one of the more intimidating experiences of my life because it was a panel of, I think, five, the editor of the paper directly in front of me, several other people on the other side, senior people, and just to my left, out of direct 
and I, I knew he was there. The guy who t- turns out was the uh, chief of staff, mm-hmm. who didn't say a word through the interview uh. until the very end. And you know, I'd done my whole spiel. Uh, this is what I've done, and you know, what I want to write on. Someone, I, I don't want to be at the Herald since I was about twelve. I was a Herald reader, the only person in my house who read the Herald. And mm-hmm. the Herald, I used to come on the train in the city for whatever reason, and, and see the old Herald building in Broadway. It's a crappy old building, and that's where I want to work. Um, and so I'm talking to them about wanting to learn and, and um, wanting to write about all these different things, and, and yes, interested in politics, which is true. I was, and. Um, then the guy who hadn't said a word through it all said, why don't you want to write about music? And I hadn't prepared for that question. I mm. wasn't expecting that. And um, it threw me for a while. And I said to him, because I want to show that I can do other things. I want to develop my skills in other areas. It's not the only thing I can do. Um, and I didn't say it, but if I thought about it properly, I probably would have said, because it's not, it's not seen as a serious route. Mm. And it wasn't then. Um, Anyway, I got I got the job, so I came came to the Herald, then. Um, as an arts reporter. No, or? as a general reporter. Okay. No, I, I I did general rounds for a couple of years, mm. um, education, whatever. Mostly as a colour writer. I mean, I that was that was my forte. I, I'm not. I'm not a grinding, rounds person. Um, you know, I could I could do it, but there were much better people at it than. Uh, than me mm. and I was I realised fairly early on that I wasn't going to be one of those people I wasn't going to go up that path of um, going going to state politics or federal politics and an international posting because that that's just not where my skills were at mm. uh, and also my interests because I realised that covering politics was a whole lot of boring shit and I had a lot of political opinions and I could write but you know, <coughs> the grind didn't appeal but I did that for two years and then the way the Herald did then, as most newspapers did, the youth sections like Metro that I'd been write, had been writing for uh, some years before um, were edited by the young people at the paper, the inexperienced people, because it was the not the most important elements of the paper. And it was it was young and whatever. So I I was asked to edit the the Metro, the Friday Entertainment Supplement. Um, and it seemed a good idea but I, uh, again I wasn't writing about music at that point and I did that for about a year and then thought why aren't we covering why aren't we doing CD reviews properly we, we, we had occasional CD reviews in the guide the TV guide on Monday it's an odd place <laughs> and I started asking why, can't, why don't we have CD reviews in this no no we have them over there See, but it's only one or two and it's it would be a classical and Bruce Elder would might do a folk or pop or, or rock thing um, and I agitated enough and this fine do, do what you want if you can find space so I set up a little space for CD reviews and put in three or four and then five um, and so I thought oh, I'm, I'm, I should write some CD reviews but the thing that turned me around was there was an interview with uh, Jar Wobble and uh, coming up and some of the music writers I'd, when I came in I shifted a number of, of music writers out some of them were really good and others weren't that good but there was a bit of a boys club that had happened there and um, I thought it needed we needed some, some, some other voices we needed some women um, so I brought in some some women for some just a different perspective a different feel to what we were doing um, but we you know we, we had contributing writers but this Joe Wobble interview came up and for whatever reason somebody else, nobody else could do it and I thought all right I'll do it I haven't done one of these for a while mm-hmm. certainly hadn't done one at the Herald and it was a great interview he was smart um, he had really interesting things to say and I felt that I actually made a really good contribution to the interview I thought and afterwards, I thought, that was good. You know, I, I can ask. I had some good questions for him. It was a really interesting thing. And I wrote the story up and I thought, I should do this. I should mm-hmm. do this more often. So I started writing and then so started writing some feature pieces. Then got the CD reviews in. And we then had, this is by then we're talking the, the um, uh, mid to late 90s when the Herald went colour. Mm. And we went 
massive, uh, not just massive colour, but the section, when I started editing Metro, it was 20 pages or 24 or something. We went up to 48. Um, mm. And so I expanded the music coverage, I expanded the CD reviews, and and um, I then started, I was the third the third set music review, live music review, uh, Bruce Elder, who'd been doing it for many years, someone who I'd always read and been influenced by so many records I bought on his recommendations and so many artists who I've come to love deeply, I first heard about through through Bruce. Um, Lucinda Williams, for example, and I'm pretty sure Gillian Welch, the first time I saw her name was in a Bruce thing. Um, I quickly became a, a big fan and a sort of pusher of her in, in the pages, but um, so Bruce Elder was the senior music career and John Casimir, um, <laughs> who was at the paper, was the other one, um, and I was the third, the third guy. But we all were pushing for more more space for what we were doing, just start taking music more seriously. And when you have people like Bruce, who who is a a brand already, and John, who's you know, an excellent writer and a and a really good thinker. And me, um, as the the junior of them, we actually had a weight of uh, of quality to 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 offer at a time when the paper was expanding. So there was space and uh, looking for things to fill and good things to fill, and we could establish a bit more presence for live reviews and and treat them seriously and say when this isn't just something that you give to the kid in the office. There's some bands in town, which 20-year-old do we have here that's sent out? Hmm. Um, and then, at that point, I was thinking, we need more than this. We need Spectrum, the Saturday supplement, the serious arts coverage, uh, apart from the arts pages, but it's it's where the, the most readers were on Saturday. And we had Spectrum, and why, why aren't we covering music like this in Spectrum? Why don't we have space in spectrum for more than the liberal reviews were writing um so that was a couple of years project as well mm. um pushing for that and so creating space in there for cd reviews that were better than you were getting anywhere else because they mm. were good writers um and thoughtful reviews and so we established a space in spectrum and um turn that into to a place where on and off because you know, fashions change editors come and go space disappears mm. and it's that's been a constant struggle trying to r- remind people that music is serious can be treated seriously and deserves space uh, but that that happened because a couple of us within the paper fought and argued for years that we can do it it's part of what we do it's part of our remit at the Herald to treat music the way we treat books or the way we treat films Mm. Uh, so then my outlets expanded so more and more uh, I was I I was writing theatre and comedy and TV and, and film occasionally but more and more music space was available and in more recent times, fewer and fewer people are available to write it. So I was, I was taking, doing lots more writing. And when Bruce moved on and then John moved on, I was the senior, senior reviewer. And so then I was you know, senior music reviewer, library reviewer, senior CD reviewer. And that's the, somehow ended up being one of the few people that, that has a full-time job writing music. Yeah, I was about to say, um, Noel Mengel left Kirimau recently. He was one of the few. Mm. There's Ian Shedden at The Australian, who's yeah. my editor. There's yourself, and um, I can't think of too many others. Well, you've got uh, New Zealand, you've got Cathy McCabe and um, uh, Cameron Adams in Melbourne. And, um, well, Nui doesn't do so much. Well, Nui Tako writes more broadly in gossip and stuff, but um, they, had a, they had a few. Um, but what's interesting about that too is we're all old. Um, I think Cameron's the youngest out of, out of that group, and he's, I'm not sure how old he is, but definitely not um, under 35. Mm. Um, so the, play, the avenues for, for, for writing about music are narrower 
mm. are narrower than ever. Or for getting paid for writing that music. Getting paid for writing that music. Get, in print, uh, there's plenty of, of other things we can talk about, but in print, the um, those avenues are, are narrow and um, it's amazing that it's still happening. Um, I was having a conversation with someone at the launch of the Sydney Writers Festival a few days ago um, who was saying, well, surely someone like you wouldn't wouldn't be kicked out by the Herald under the you know with the new redundancies. There's no certainty of that because arts coverage is constantly under threat, mm. and uh, music is not top rank in arts for a lot of managers at all media organisations. You know, it's it fluctuates, but it's never it's certainly not books. And it's not film Mm. because film everybody goes to everybody knows um, books even if they don't read all those books they know it's prestigious and it's important so we need to have we have to look like a serious paper (laughs) while the music yeah well we'll see yeah right coming towards the end just a couple of uh, couple of things I want to ask you first um, tell me a bit more about the voice recognition software that you now use how did that come about and how is it working out for you uh, uh, well I I had um, in my first newspaper job at the Penrith Press, I had um, RSI um, quite badly, hmm. but um, I did some treatment and learned to touch type because I'd been a very fast but brutal two finger typist yeah. and learned to touch type and managed it, and I was fine. Um, in fact, one of the weirdest one of the weirdest things that, that ever happened to me was that when it initially happened I've never actually taken any time off for for, for this I kept working through it all mm. but one of the ways I've worked was there was a um, a trainee she wasn't yet a cadet who typed for me so I sat behind her now at first it was weird enough having having gone from typewriters to computer keyboard that was that was a strange different thing to do to learn how to do that um, but here I was having to sit with this person and talking. It wasn't music, but it was sitting next to her and talking a story out, and she's typing in, and I'm saying, oh, no, actually, no, hold on, thinking. And I just imagine the poor girl sitting there, <laughs> fuck's sake, hurry up. What? What word? Um, but so years on at the Herald, uh, I had a, a year or so where I was working incredibly Hard. We're doing probably seven, eight thousand words a week, mm. which is just stupid. Yeah, um, but I'd started doing some work at home at that point, and I was determined that they not think that I was slacking off because I was working from home. Because um, it was easy to listen to music and sometimes to do some some interviews and certainly to write with music listening um, to do it from home. Mm. Um, so working from home for a day or so a week and the higher level of work. I, I think the technical term is I completely fucked my arms, um, <laughs> and I'm now permanently, permanently crippled. Really, um, I can. It was so severe at the time that at its worst I couldn't, I couldn't grip things properly. Hmm. I couldn't open jars, well at all, and I guess, but I think it's a reasonably accurate guess that I lost about twenty five percent of my arm strength. Um, just because I couldn't, I couldn't grip um, you know, tense through my arms. It was incredibly bad. Is, but again, is there I a name for that condition? Well, or? it's it's tendonitis. It's RSI. It was you know, long out of fashion, but mm. that's probably what people would most recognise. It's just it's a it's a repetitive strain injury, um, repetitive work, um, that, and what happened then is I went to start doing a lot of therapy started set myself up um, and this time they actually forced me to take to do workers compensation so as part of that this person came out evaluated how set my desk up properly and said okay playing my tapes at that point still had audio tapes I had a a tape recorder on it on a uh, desk next to my main desk and reaching cross right pressing stop play stop Mm. play rewind and so that's that's bad that's that's just that's exacerbating your existing serious issues so we're going to get you this um, thing where it's pedal operated 
and you, know, you can play the, the tapes back like that. And she said, and we'll get you voice recognition software. So um, headset, talk, talk into it. And um, so I would pedal operate the tape. I would play back the tape and speak it mm. um, instead of what I would have done before, which is play it back and write it uh, or type it onto the screen. So um, I would, and then I would write my stories by talking it through. Uh, that actually, a lot of people think that's that must have been really hard to adjust to. It was actually a lot easier to adjust to than um, some of the other things I've had to do, because my style of writing is quite close to my style of speaking, mm. and um, so when I think and speak it, it's it's writing in that way so so I wasn't having to to it helps that the, the what I do is it's not uh, sort of straight down the line fact writing it's 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 more of a it's a personal more personal voice it's mm. more um, conversational. discursive con- conversational so that helped but so I then had to learn how to talk my stories rather than, than type because for a long while I couldn't use my hands at all. Mm. Now I can I can do short bursts, and when I'm travelling I do a bit more because I've got a laptop and you can't do it on the laptop. Yeah, you have a keyboard here. Somewhere I, in the I room. don't know because uh, I'm not writing this this weekend. Uh-huh. I've got my iPad, but that's that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but when I travel, I've I've got a, a laptop and and um, that's okay as long as I really manage it and, mm. and don't. You know, don't push it and do all the all the exercises but it's, it's it's not a good thing for him to do but you can't I can't you can't get the voice recognition software for, for um, laptops of any worth mm. um, the voice rec voice recognition stuff claims to be up to 90% accurate utter bullshit <laughs> um, on a very good day maybe you get 80% accurate and um, it still requires adjustments it's it it's a pain in the ass in lots of ways, but if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be working. Yeah, I, it would be impossible for me to work without it. It also means I, um, I can't really work in an office environment because it's bad enough for everybody else having me, having me talking all the time. Uh, in mm. an office where everybody's talking loud anyway, but for me, I need relative quiet around me because there's stuff. It can handle two voices, but generally only one, mm. and certainly. Pardon me, ambient noise, extraneous noise would just freak it out. So um, I work from home in a quiet room, and desk, music playing, and that's fine. But um, otherwise, just sitting at a desk talking constantly to the computer. That's fucking amazing. Like, you're the first writer I've met whose love for writing and career from writing has, in fact, physically impaired you. And. <laughs> That's that's an incredible story. I feel bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I said that the. Uh, luckily, I've still been able to do it. Mm. Um, it's and I'm generally fine. Um, a little flare ups, but I, I'm not prevented from doing anything. But it was so bad at one point that I could, there were a lot of things I couldn't do, and, um, but now I can. There's only a handful of things that are impractical for me to do, or that cause me difficulties because it's it's it is completely it's permanently damaged mm. I'm not I'm not ever going to be someone who can sit there and happily type away for four hours five mm. hours it's just gone but I'm still working and the voice recognition thing it fits in with me you know I do all it'd be better but it's it's fine mm. all right last question are there words that you think music writers should not use or the, your pet peeves that you read them and you think oh, we wish you had written something else um, sophomore mm. I hate sophomore album <laughs> um, there are a number of things a number of phrases uh, that, I, that I don't like um, but that's one that always comes to mind because it's only ever used in music journalism mm. and it's stupid we picked it up from the Americans. 
but nobody in Australia says sophomore. You're not a sophomore in your second year at uh, university. That's just not how we talk, mm. or first year, or whatever. Um, th- so, um, yeah, there are many other expressions, uh, and with a bit of time, I'll probably come up with them. But there are there are a lot of music writing cliches. Oh that, yeah, for sure. That um, that drive me up the wall, and um, which is another going back to something we talked about. Like three days ago when we started this um, about doing it differently trying to approach each review differently the, um, I try not to use this the stock music journalism phrases I have my own stock phrases which I'm sure irritate people as well but I try not to use them as much but I definitely try not to use the stock music journalism phrases that you see um, everywhere particularly with people who think that they um that it's easy to be a music journalist um, and so we can do this and put that in and put that phrase in and say um, not that I can think of any off the top of my head yeah I think the reliance or the tendency is for uh, young writers starting out is to load their text with adjectives yeah and adverbs yeah and, and you know hell in the 30 years in my career I still overdo the adjectives at times but yeah the, 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 the biggest problem with young writers is we all love the sound of our voices and we love sounding smart mm. and we want people to know how smart we are and the best lesson you learn hopefully is that you can be smart without having to shout it and um, you can you can use good words you don't have to use all of them all the time <laughs> but you know, it's it's really hard to learn that and but you're only going to learn that if, first of all, somebody tells you, somebody shows you, mm. and somebody reworks your copy, which is why I was saying about the street press. I never liked street press because I didn't get any better doing that because no one was telling me that doesn't work. Um, or that phrase you think means this doesn't mean that at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> innovating. I remember the first time I used innovating, and I thought it meant something else, the opposite of what it meant. And so somebody picked up and said, no <laughs> that's not what it means damn um, but if you don't if you don't do that if you don't have your your period of excessive writing and, and over um, reliance on, on your your wit and, and deep brilliance um, you're probably a little too boring to start you've got to do it you've got to have that you can't yes. all be you can't all be Eric Jensen <laughs> Eric, Eric Jensen is another appalling human being. He was doing work experience at the Herald. When he was like, what, 14 or something? He was 15, 16. Uh, I was up, actually joking, I didn't realise. He, he, <laughs> he came up to see me, and um, they, all the work, a lot of the work experience kids, this is when I was still working in the Herald office, not at home, and he came around to see me and said he'd, he'd been writing some stuff and he'd like to write, and I said, yeah, sure, you know, 15 year old kid, whatever. And, show me your stuff he showed me six and they were disgustingly good he was <laughs> such a good writer and I thought you're a better writer at 15 than I was at 25 and probably if I'm really honest you're better than I am now hmm. um, at least have a great potential already evident hmm. and I tried to convince the, um, the editor of, of uh, Metro at the time to, let, to write for us didn't want to know who was going to write a 15, let a 15 year old kid write? I said, This kid's really good. Um, apparently, the line, he's better than I was 10 years older, then didn't work. I don't think the editor rated me much anyway. <laughs> um, so instead, I got Eric to write some CD reviews for us. And then later that year, which is how I've got a lot of the writers we've, we've used over the years in, uh, bring them in to write some CD reviews and put their names in front of editors. And then they get a few more gigs. Um, some good writers who come through doing that um, Eric I, I threw Eric's name up we were looking for someone to do a, a piece on schoolies so this is the next year when I, I think he was in his final year then <laughs> um, and I put his name forward for for doing a diary uh, either an HSC diary or a schoolies diary mm. and um, you know, he was his talent by then was just too obvious for even the thickest people to, to miss right. and um and we, we took him on soon after, uh-huh. after he finished. He had a choice of going to uni or coming to work for us. And uh, we had a discussion about it. And 
I would check out a lot more people he was talking to. I was just one of the people in there, but I was saying, you could do it now. You could do it in five years. You can come back to us and we'd, we'd take you. Um, you you're so good. It mm-hmm. wouldn't matter. And in the end, he chose to come to us and bastard. I said to him, the only thing I ask of you is, um, could you give me five or ten years? Just because you're going to take you're going to take my job. You're going you're to make me redundant, um, and I just like to have a bit of time. So maybe don't do music straight away. Um, luckily, he came in and did a lot of good things and moved on and did a lot of great things, but uh, didn't take my job. Yeah, just to conclude the anecdote, uh, Eric Jensen is the founding editor of the Saturday Paper, and uh, yes, he's. And biographer of uh, Adam Cullen. Right, yes. Uh, prodigiously talented man. Perhaps yeah. he'll be on penmanship one day. But in the meantime, thanks very much for talking to me, Bernard. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Penmanship, and thank you to my guest, Bernard Zool. You can find show notes to this episode and all previous episodes at penmanshippodcast.com. If you'd like to get in touch with me with feedback praise, criticism, guest suggestions, you can email me, andrew at penmanshippodcast.com. You can also find the show on Twitter, at penmanshipau, and on Facebook. The theme song for Penmanship is Eternally Yours by Australian band Laughing Clowns. That's it for now. Until next time. Until next time.